know about Peter, he was part of uh, the Framingham study group. Uh, he had done his postgraduate training at Duke after going to med school at the University of Texas. And he went there and it was part of the Framingham group who did all the Framingham data that you've heard about since you've been in your medical career. And he also was left from there as he became one of the directors of NHLBI as the National Heart and Lung and Blood Institute. And then finally went from there to uh, South Carolina where he was a professor of medicine there and then came here to, to Emory as a professor of medicine in endocrinology and general medicine. And I said you can talk with Peter for just for a few moments and learn a lot. It might be about things of walking down the street that day or something else, but he's, al he's always very knowledgeable about his subject. So Peter, we're delighted to have you. Uh, thanks very much, Doug. So we're going to go into cardiovascular disease and diabetes. And this is, in addition to lipids, this is one of my favorite topics. So am I going to start this or are the folks in the back? There we go. We're all set. I have no disclosures. And I'm going to have a case. This is going to be a case that's much closer to clinical, general clinical medicine than it is to cardiology or endocrinology. Uh, I see patients like this all the time. I think most people in medicine do. And I'm going to quickly go through. I'm not going to read every word. I can't see the screen there, so I'm going to just read the screen here. And I'm just going to read some of the highlights. So 65-year-old retired white man with diabetes times five years. He's, had, he's on metformin, relatively high dose. Glucose is a little bit high, 150 to 200. A1C 7.8. Man like this, the goal would be 7%, remember. No hypo episodes. He's uh, for blood pressure, he's taking chlorothaladone. And he does home monitoring, that's good. 130 over 80 is usually, he's in that range. Cholesterol's following a low fat diet, takes Atorva 10. Recent lipids, the LDL we zip in on is 105. Uh, Ten-year risk using the, the 2013 calculator, or you can update it even to the newer one, 8.8%. He's overweight. He's obese, in fact, BMI 32, not having much luck with reduction of weight. Creatinine 1.4, and there's his EGFR in the 50 range. Casual protein. Remember, you gotta use, you're supposed to do this once a year, albumin to creatinine ratio and a casual protein. That doesn't reach the range of microalbuminuria, so he's okay for that. Had his teleretinal screening. He's supposed to get that yearly, and that's good. Vascular disease, no history. MI, stroke, walks. I th walks a mile a day. Ask every diabetic patient how far they walk. It's a quick screening question for whether they have PAD, whether they have DBT history, et cetera, et cetera. Sleeps through the night lying flat. So you can see I was at sort of a couple of feeler questions. I didn't say there whether he had an edema. He had no, no peripheral edema by history. And then his exam is really pretty normal. No edema. Foot exam. I always do a foot exam when I see a diabetic patient. And he doesn't have any neuropathy. So the next slide here is simply this, the same thing. And it highlights the things that we should focus on. So blood pressure, glucose, cholesterol, weight, kidney disease, a little bit of a concern. And blood pressure is not so bad for physical exam. So I have a handful of what I call of things to prevent. They hope they don't boil over, keep them out of trouble. What am I going to tell him? Well, first of all, he doesn't have clinical heart disease, but he's got at least a 65% chance, uh, according to national data. This is old data, but a, an analysis that Carolyn Fox and I did in Framingham, this would be 80 to 90% chance lifetime risk of developing cardiovascular disease, especially for a BMI, as you can see there in the 30 plus range. These people are going to get heart disease before they pass away. They may not die of heart disease, but they're going to get cardiovascular disease. And in his age range, almost every, every single outcome is at least a double to a tripling. And uh, we're talking about a man, but if a woman was uh, in front of us, it's a, more of a tripling than a doubling. So the risks are even greater uh, for women in this age range. Now this slide, I apologize, it's a little hard to see. This is from um, the recent summary. There are two places that you should think about for diabetes and heart disease. One is the recent guidelines for, that Amelia Benjamin's the first author of, 
uh, that comes out every year in circulation in January, and it has a whole bunch of slides and figures. It's a couple hundred pages long. And this figure is from there, and as you can see, uh, on the diabetes population on the left, we're doing better compared to the general population. I think most of you are aware of what's going on in the general population, but you can see there at the top there, ischemic heart disease. It's coming way down, but it's still the top, uh, the top uh, outcome of interest. And almost all of these are coming down. Some of them are flat. The one that, uh, the reason to put this in there also is in gray, just below that blue line, is heart failure. And in fact, heart failure wasn't being tracked as assiduously as it is now, and heart failure is still coming down. And I like to think that that's probably going to be part of the focus of this talk is uh, what we can do to keep it going down further. Now, I put this a little bit out of place because I'm not going to talk about peripheral artery disease too much. And our patient, I didn't think, had PAD. He could walk a mile after all. But I wanted to share with you a, a recent analysis done by Schripper Aria, who was one of my colleagues here. Unfortunately, she's now at head of vascular surgery at the VA at uh, Palo Alto, and she left to go to the West Coast. But high-intensity statins in PAD patients uh, prevented amputations. This is incredibly important because we're going to have patients you see on a regular basis who are diabetes, diabetes especially if they smoke, and you can prevent. So you can prevent the amputation. And you have, this hasn't worked its way into a guideline yet, but I would think it will in the next year or two. It's only a year old, this paper. And it's, so ATORVA 10 is much different from ATORVA 80. You should go all the way all up. That's art of medicine, no guideline, but it's from our own data based on the largest database uh, ever assembled, over 150,000 uh, veterans. Now, what about metformin? Every, I, I deliberately put a couple of things on the tipping point for this patient because there's probably not a physician who's not writing metformin on a regular basis. So you want to keep metformin in the schema, in the care for your type 2 diabetics if you can. It reduces micro and macrovascular disease, reduces mortality and myocardial infarction. Now, remember our patient had a creatinine of 1.4. He had an EGFR of around 50. Oh, I start reading, oh, I'm not sure I can use the metformin anymore. There was, uh, there was analysis undertaken by Geisinger uh, Clinic in the greater Philadelphia area, and they were, as you track there in green going across, according to EGFR and the hazard ratio for acidosis, and it just doesn't bump up. You know, when you get down to the lower levels, you can see to the far right an EGFR less than 30, okay, we've got a doubling. EGFR less than 30. Remember our patient with a creatinine 1.4, middle-aged, EGFR 50. So you can continue to use the uh, uh, metformin in that patient. And then there's been another analysis similar in the last year or so is maybe I could consider reducing the dose. And this has not gotten into the guidelines yet either, and this is also art of medicine. So remember that patient was on 2,000 milligrams a day. So if he continues to bump up, or if he gets a hospitalization, gets some chronic uh, acute kidney injury, and then he comes out, uh, for the short term, you could put him on a lower dose. You might go to 500, more likely 1,000, something to think about as you go forward with this patient. Don't feel you have to stop the metformin, though. Just pay attention to the creatinine and how he's doing, and your acidosis risk is really not much different from others. Now, metformin is the time-honored medication, but uh, this has been the biggest growth field for cardiometabolic drugs in the last 10 years, is glycemic drugs that hopefully will have other effects on the cardiovascular and the glycemic uh, system and the kidney, et cetera, virtually every, every organ you might consider. Metformin's there on the top left. We have thiazolidine dions, an example, PO or rosiglitazone or metformin, again, working on the muscle at the top right. Uh, we have the uh, a pancreatic lipase medication, Orlistat, which is a, not really much of a glycemic drug, but it's also a facilitator. We have agcarbos, a medication that causes a lot of intestinal gas. Not a very high choice, but it's also a potential consideration. Then we have a handful of some of these newer ones, such, such as the SGLT2 inhibitors, those are a mouthful, and that's why you say it slowly, S-G-L-T. And I like to call them gliflozins because you can say that a lot easier. And the urine flows, and they're really working mostly at the kidney and on urinary me mechanisms. And then uh, sulfonylureas, which have been around 
even longer than metformin. Uh, and then finally, we got the glyptins. Uh, liraglutide is an example. And citagliptin, two types of, of mechanisms uh, for the incretin uh, mechanisms for uh, lowering glucose. So let me mention at least a little bit about more. We're going to go into this also for what happens for the SGLT2. This is one of the first examples of uh, precision medicine. It was identified uh, metabolically for children who had glucose in their urine, but they didn't have kidney disease. So they were spilling at less than the typical renal tubular maximum. And this will help you if you know this mechanism, how you're going to use it and how you're going to explain it to your patient. So remember that renal tubular maximum from physiology is typically in the 200 to 250 range milligrams per deciliter. And once you, I put anybody's glucose over that, and then I get urine output, I'm going to have glucose in that urine. So this tricks the tubule, the proximal tubule, to spilling at 150. So if I give it to you and you have a, a bunch of Coca-Colas or glucose tolerance test, I could probably get you to have urine, urinary glucose as well, because it just tricks the tubule into spilling at a lower level. Now, we'll come back to that, but just that's an important thing to share, because you're going to have a urine with more glucose than usual. Now, as you can see here, over the last 20 years, we have had an, just a burst, a real burst of all these different medications. And um, I'm in the cardiology division, and my chief, Bob Taylor, is here. And all my colleagues come up to me and say, how do we use these new drugs? Every time I give a cardiology conference talk, it seems I'm talking about these new drugs. And so I'm going to give you some of the background of it and the flavor for how to use the drugs. And get used to using them. Most, most times when I ask people to raise their hands, it's fewer than 10 or 15 percent are regularly using the new diabetes drugs, especially for the patients at high, high, high risk for heart disease. Now, within the American Diabetes Association guidelines, they have tables like this, figures like this, that say, think of your patient. I gave us, our patient is a 65-year-old who's got a couple of risk factors, an over-the-threshold risk, but he's not at super high risk. He's not 80 years old. He doesn't have an A1C of 10, et cetera. He's not already has post-MI, has heart failure. So think about what I'm going to do. I can actually be fairly aggressive because he walks a mile a day. He's, he's thinking about uh, perhaps maybe he could do some other things. He's trying to work on his diet. All right. So one of the first things that, and this is what triggered what's happened in the last 10 years, is the thiazolidine dions, another long one, which we call TZDs for short. The TZD story started off by Steve Nissen's meta-analysis in the New England Journal a little more than 10 years ago. And as you can see highlighted with a red box is overall myocardial infarction and overall uh, cardiovascular disease death was increased for persons taking TZD. Uh, this meta-analysis was a, not a complete meta-analysis, and you can guess what happened. More meta-analyses came. There were three or four. I'm just going to show you a couple of them. And they did not agree with what Dr. Nissen had reported. So overall, as you can see there on the top, uh, no increase in cardiovascular disease death. And then, according to Rosie and Pio, pretty much the same signal. So that's cardiovascular disease death. So they look OK. But what did they do? They increased cardiac failure risk. So that led to the FDA creating a guidance. And there was a 2008 guidance saying, let's have safety for glucose-related drugs. We don't want to be blindsided by a issue whereby a drug is good for glucose. These are good glucose drugs. They're good for lipids, too, especially pioglitazone. But then you can get increased fluids, and you can push a patient into heart failure. So this has been one of the medicines. For instance, most endocrinologists would reserve this for a much younger type 2 diabetic patient and somebody who's not at risk at all of heart failure. So you can use it, but think very early who you're going to use it with. Next came the ACCORD trial. Now, the ACCORD trial was one of these... Um, Three-headed major NIH trials had glucose, blood pressure, and lipids, and it was stopped early because of the glucose showed um, adverse effect. Adverse effect. And the premise in Accord was, well, we know everybody ought to have an A1C in middle age under seven. Let's say, let's go for under six. That's just simplifying what was in the glucose arm. 
and we'll add on lots of medicines and we'll put people under six. And think about it, well, that means we're going to have more hypoglycemia. And they, they didn't document the hypoglycemia so well, but they certainly found the adverse effect. As you can see, the death risk, 1.22, and the overall cardiovascular disease death risk in this very large trial. So the, the glucose arm was stopped, and now there's been great concern over the past five, ten years even, for what, what is causing it. Um, so we, d we undertook a... There hasn't been really a target and analysis, but this is the type of question we can ask in population studies. So Larry Phillips and I, when our large VA databases, collaborated with some of our other teammates around the country, and this paper just came out last month, uh, showing A1C and eight-year mortality risk. This is the largest group of uh, uh, individuals, and in this is all since 2002, and over 300,000 veterans with diabetes mellitus. And as you can see there, the increased risk goes when you get less than six. And it's, and it's really not related too much to whether you have pre previous disease, and it's really not related too much to eight, which agents. However, to get less than six and to get hypoglycemia, historically, you largely have to be using a sulfonylurea or using an insulin product. Okay. Now, what about that heart failure signal that came up in TZD? So there has been a now, four studies, as you can see here, these are big trials. Each of these trials is 50 to $100 million, sometimes more, to demonstrate safety with newer glucose products because of the TZD concerns. The first one, and they're, they're pretty much shown in historical order. You'd like to think, actually, these drugs may prevent heart failure if we keep getting more products. But it's interesting, the, the hazard ratio keeps going down with newer studies. Uh, but the overall impression now, for the first two drugs, there was increased risk, but now it's neutral risk. So within the FDA for new glucose drugs, there's the concept of creating trials that are called non-inferiority -inferior, trials or safety trials, or just to show that I can use this for glucose lowering and not get my patient into trouble. And that's the principle behind all this. But it has costed a lot of money, and this guidance that's been in place since 2008 is now under review by FDA, and we'll see if we're going to get a new guidance. It's very possible that they will revise it over the next few months. Okay, next, next types of molecules, remember, is the tied drugs. So I, I didn't mention too much about those. Those are Remember, there, there are two types of uh, incretin drugs. This is one of them. Uh, so liraglutide is perhaps the, the, the most potent and the one for which we have lots of information. Uh, who, who might benefit from liraglutide? So this is for persons who have uh, atherosclerotic disease who've been in these trials, especially. Uh, it's an injection. Uh, most of these others are oral pills, but most of the, uh, the, the tides are injectable drugs. And some of the products can be taken once a week, and then you can go once a day, and then some of them you can have high dose once a day, especially for those who are overweight. Remember, our patient had a BMI of uh, 32, but he didn't have atherosclerotic disease. There, I didn't have anything like that in the chart. So maybe would be a consideration for him. And as you can see there, liraglutide, uh, 0.87, so favorable effect on uh, major cardiovascular events, or MACE, which we typically abbreviate as MACE, or say it uh, as a quick word. Similar for CVD death within liraglutide in the LEADER trial, also a uh, favorable effect. This is even stronger, 0.78. And then... Now we move into the SGLT2 drugs, remember the gliflozins, the ones that work on the kidney mechanism. All right, so the, this Empireg was the first big trial. This came before the FDA around 2015, 2016 with a large uh, panel of endocrinologists and the cardiologists. Um, and as you can see there, what is, it, what is the major adverse effects? It's favorable in, in, in terms of empagliflozin. In addition, um, they had some heart failure hospitalization data, but it wasn't extremely well-documented heart failure hospitalization data, but it saved lives, and it, it really prevented MACE. Uh, so the, interestingly, the endocrinologists have voted to, um, let's see more data and not to approve it, and all the cardiologists voted to approve it. 
Then it went to the FDA, and the FDA approved it. So this was the first SGL2 uh, inhibitor. In fact, there are SGL2T1 inhibitors. They work mostly in the gut. They're not available yet. But the twos, this was the first in class, and it is, uh, is having a very strong. Here's the death signal. It's even stronger. As you can see, there's 0 0.62. So who is my patient who might uh, benefit from this? A patient with uh, um, heart failure or borderline high risk at heart failure, and somebody for whom, remember I have, so it's a co-transporter in the tubule taking out glucose, as I've already mentioned, but also taking out sodium. So some of these patients uh, uh, might already be on a loop uh, drug such as uh, Lasix, and you might add this to it. Or you could even go earlier. But if it works through the kidney, how far can I go for kidney function to have it work? Can I use it when the person is making almost no urine? Well, absolutely not. You can guess if I'm going to get part of the glucose out through the urine, I have to have urinary output. Uh, but you're going to get to a certain point where you're going to have diminishing uh, payoff, so to speak, from using this sort of drug. And if you pull out your Hippocrates, it's going to say, for sure, you get an EGFR less than 30, you're not going to prescribe this drug. So we're going to show you a little data there for subgroups. But what about over 30? Uh, a pharmacologist may say, ah, 30 to 45, I'm not sure it's going to work. And there have now been some subgroup analysis following up on uh, the EMPA-REG trial and others, as you'll show you in a minute. Now, that was the first class, but now there is others, the canagliflozin. Unfortunately, this was the molecule that also uh, collected more data on peripheral artery disease, and there was a concern that peripheral artery disease might actually get worse. And they were uh, also found other side effects associated with uh, this molecule, but another glyphlosin with favorable effect. But you see way down there on the bottom, ooh, it even works, 40% reduction, EGFR, et cetera, et cetera. It may even have some favorable effects on kidney function. And then Mikhail Kozabov from St. Louis in uh, Kansas City collaborated across the world with the biggest database out there, 309,000 plus, showing that these drugs are a favorable effect for uh, uh, cardiovascular outcomes, and this is mortality, just overall mortality across canagliflozin, dapagliflozin, and empagliflozin across all of them all around the world with a consortium effort. Now, go back, going back to the kidney disease, so this is the first slide here, is individuals with less than 60 versus greater than 60 e EGFR. And if you look over to the far right, you can see everything that was investigated is all in the favorable direction. And they investigated cardiovascular death, hospitalization for heart failure, all-cause mortality, and all-cause hospitalization. So these drugs are, even work pretty well for persons with relatively low EGFR. And then even a subgroup analysis, and this is even more recent, I guess the last six months or so, within EMPA-REG, and the group to the far right are the persons really with fairly like okay kidney function, but the two left groups are EGFR left less than 45, but it had to be 30 to 45 for the most part to get into these trials, and then 45 to 60. And again, they seem to work. So we should be uh, really paying attention to, if the person's making urine and may benefit, we really maybe go ahead, feel comfortable going ahead with this medication. Now, there are other side effects. I'm going to get to those in a minute. So, but you, you should recognize that they really are potent and they're saving lives. They certainly are better than a metformin adding on your second drug as a sulfonylurea, such as glipizide or gliburide, which is perhaps what most internal medicine doctors do around the country and around the world. And most recent one in the last six months is now DAPA, DAPA glyphlosin in the DECLARE trial. Again, this is a non-inferiority so showing uh, overall safety and no increased uh, risks. Now, I have two slides here that I sort of summarize all that we've shown for data. And these are what I call little box types of slides that help us make decisions. So we start out with metformin on the left. Um, decreased MI benefit. There are others, as I mentioned. Uh, 
start out your patient with on metformin lo, slow and go slowly to get to your full dosing over a month. One of the more common reasons to have nausea, vomiting, diarrhea is to go quickly to 2,000 milligrams per day. Go a little slower, get your patient up there. And it's hard because if your patient failed and started immediately a high dose, they may have lost confidence in using this drug. The lactic acidosis risk, relatively small, as we talked about. And then the low EGFR, think about potentially reducing it as you go down for each of the kidney stage for CKD. Sulfonylureas. Now, we use a lot of sulfonylureas in the community. Um, every physician has some patients pretty much on these medications. They cause hypoglycemia for your patients with chronic kidney disease. Remember, they don't get cleared very well. You can have persistent hypoglycemia. It can last for hours and days. The patient uh, took too much, you know, and you, you might have a patient with mental problems and just took too much, and he has decreased kidney clearance, and it, you have real problems. Uh, also, you can get, tend to gain weight on this. TZDs, we've already discussed mostly. There is that small element that may decrease ASCVD events, but then on the other flip is the increase of cardiac failure on the, as a concern. And then the newer drugs. So the DTP, DPP-4 is an example. You can get angioedema. Uh, pancreatitis, now this has been pushed around more than two or three times. Uh, Francisco Pasquale reminded me yesterday that John Buse re recently wrote a meta-analysis uh, that showed that the pancreatitis risk, although it doesn't happen very often, it is increased. So for sure, somebody who you think is at risk for pancreatitis or has ever had it in the past, uh, think twice about using a glyptin drug. And the hospitalizations, and the answer to that with all these recent trials is no. Uh, the GLP receptor agonist drugs, the, the TIDE drugs, uh, those are very favorable for weight. You know, remember our patient had 32 uh, kilograms per meter squared for his BMI. If he'd been a lot heavier, for sure, I would thinking, oh, yeah, I really want to use a Tide drug. Might start him off with once a week, then go to once daily. Um, he'd have to take an injection. There's always the start injections, and many patients are resistant. So starting with once a week, though, is a way to bridge that sometimes. Uh, some GI side effects. They, some people say, yeah, I lost weight, but I wasn't hungry at all. So th there is a concern. That's, it's, it's a side effect, definitely uh, associated. With. And then finally, the SGLT2s, is uh, you can use them with the other medications. Now, I haven't mentioned the side effects. So one of them to think about is if you have urine that has glucose in it, uh, you're going to have increased risk for urinary tract infections. You're going to have increased risk of uh, uh, fungal infections. Now, this is the one that the big bugaboo, so to speak, is ketoacidosis, but the glucose is relatively normal. Uh, you can monitor that. The patient can with every few days with ketone testing, either urine or plasma ketones. There's not an awful lot of data out there. I think we're going to start to see more. There, that not necessarily the patient can buy a ketone testing device. They're not necessarily something they're going to get reimbursed for. And then finally limb ischemia and especially um, in the buttock area ischemia, ischemia. So I personally don't gen think to prescribe this at all to a person who's totally at bed rest or who is wheelchair bound because you're going to have them sitting in all the time in glucose that's uh, glucose with urine and it's a setup for getting uh, a buttock infections and gangrene. So, and that's been reported as a very severe adverse event for uh, these medications. Now, taking all that together, and you say, oh, my goodness, look at that slide. That's what the ADA guideline shows. And uh, I'm not going to go through that, it, but that you can find this on that website, and I think it's going to be helpful to print a slide like this and then put it in clinics so you understand. The first thing is after metformin, that's almost everybody's first drug, is you have all these choices, and that's what's in the yellow panel. You can pick almost any one. If you, one thing that you might take from this talk today is you could think beyond sulfonylureas. You're probably always thinking sulfonylureas up to now, but you could think beyond that. For some of your patients, you certainly could go there, especially those at higher heart disease risk, like our patient. All right, so the next slide is going to focus on this subgroup over to the far left. It's just a recapitulation of what you just saw. And 
If ASCVD predominates, you should especially be thinking of the persons with a GLP receptor agonist. And if there's heart failure or CKD, you think especially for the SGLT2 drugs with the monitoring precautions and advice to patients, as I mentioned. Now, a couple of other things here. I'm going fast, I apologize, but uh, when to start insulin? That's one of the questions that comes up for diabetes, and it's not necessarily tremendously associated with uh, cardiovascular disease in patients, but in our guidelines, it's A1C over 10. Some patients, A1C over 9, especially, for instance, patients recently in the hospital, their A1C is still over 9, and you're sending them home. You're, we would recommend, typically, that you would send them home on insulin. Glucose levels greater than 300 as an outpatient. Think to reach for insulin. You don't have to go uh, long-acting plus pre-meal. You can start off especially with long-acting, and Atlantis is generally what we would prefer. And uh, continuing the other meds, you can continue to the metformin. Uh, generally, if you are had them on metformin and a sulfonylurea and you're going to add Lantus, you're going to drop the sulfonylurea, though. Okay. The person's symptomatic on presentation. And then in the hospital, if you can always... You don't always have to get a full endocrine consult. As we know, medicine doctors don't typically ask for endocrinology consults for in-hospital uh, glycemic care. Uh, but we're doing it for all over the hospital. And if you have a problem, you can always call, call a fellow, call an attending, get, get some advice. What should I do? I'm stuck. You don't have to get a full consult. So get some advice at times for exactly, especially if you're having trouble regulating an insulin, because most of these patients are on insulin. And as you might guess, within the hospital right now, almost all the focus has been on glucose control and typically 140 to 80 as the target. Uh, but Guillermo Ampieres and other colleagues, especially at Grady, are uh, testing out all, virtually all of the oral medications. Or might we be able to move to that in the future for regardless of the types of uh, problems that they may be admitted for? Now, remember our patient had hypertension. What should we do with his hypertension? He's on chlorothaladone, and that's okay. And can, you can use that all the way down to a very low EGFR, and he's at 50. He's not cl close to that yet. Uh, so typically, 130 over 80 would be for a younger person uh, as a goal, but he, he's 140 over 90 as the goal with one drug. That's fine for him, Okay. He does not have albuminuria, but he might next year. Remember, he had 20 milligrams per gram of creatinine. That should be done every year. And if he does that, you should add an ACE or an ARB. So then let's say next year you add the ACE or the ARB. And once you've shown that he can handle the chlorothaladone plus the ACE or the ARB, you could then move to a combination pill. So that would, because a lot of these diabetic patients are on lots of medicines. And then... Once you've, typically you're going to have a patient on a diuretic, he's going to be on an ACE and an ARB, and then he's going to be on one of several other classes. And if you can't control the next two things, or to remember is to get a consult and also to work on reducing the sodium in his diet. Uh, George Backris says that by far one of the most common things is nobody even has a sodium conversation with a patient. And I know that's tough here in Georgia, but even a handout sheets, uh, these are the products that are high in sodium. Now, what about statin for our patient? Our patient was on 10 milligrams of atorvastatin. That's beneath the radar. Should he be on a statin to begin with? Yeah, he should be on a statin. His risk was 8.8%. Everybody would have pretty much agree with that. Uh, 40 to 75 years old, his risk is above the threshold. So yes, he's going to be on a statin. Now, how potent a statin should he be on? He does not have heart disease. So it's somewhere between a little more than 10, probably, to 80. And what do you want to do next? Do you want to put him on 40 or 80? I'm, I'm so gun shy because I'm in a lipid clinic. I get people who've already failed more than one stat. I typically say, let's start titrating you up. So uh, you're going to go up on 10. Let's go to 20, for instance, as the next step. And then very recently in Donna Arnett's, they gave what are called risk enhancers. Now, this ADA, the American Diabetes Association, has slightly different guidelines, and they haven't really uh, come in on this same concept. But if the person has any of these, that means more statins, so to speak. Um, our patient, does he have any of those? Yep, he's got the EGFR under 60, and that's it. 
So he has one of them. But if he'd had several of them, it really was going to be stronger in pushing him up uh, to a higher dose stat. Should he lose weight? Yes, of course he should lose weight. He's a BMI of 32. Uh, that's going to put him for sure in the 200 to 250 plus range. Um, he should consider, in addition to his diet, but medications. And most of the medication programs, such as Orlistat, such as the fentamine topiramate, which is probably one of the leading ones that's prescribed, um, you're going to get 5 to 15 percent, typically 6 to 8 percent lowering. So it's something to consider. If you wanted, you could also get a dietary consult. You could send them to the obesity clinic. But the other thing I have not mentioned here is you might also, in this patient, think of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. So I didn't mention it, but you'd probably be looking at his liver profile, looking at his liver function tests. And if those were high, you would also probably think to get a liver ultrasound and, and especially all of those together, you might get a liver consult. Does he have non-alcoholic fatty liver disease? So to come back to our patient, so uh, I think, whoops, I'll go back. <clears throat> so most of these I've already recapitulated, but I'll go over it now. So, so the patients on metformin, considering lowering the dose, I, I would stick it out at 2,000 with a creatinine 1.4. But if, let's say he goes into the hospital, gets acute kidney injury, comes out, oh, am I going to stop the metformin? No, I'd, I'd, I'd use a lower dose then. I might go to 1,000 milligrams a day. I might consider uh, using a gliflozin drug. Uh, not absolutely necessary, but remember his A1C is 7.8, each of these drugs, recall, is worth about a half a unit for your A1C. He's not going to get there uh, just with a little more metformin. He's at the top of the range pretty much for metformin. You could go to an XR uh, formulation, but you, you probably need a second drug. Now, many of you would just reach for a sulfonylurea, and that would be okay, but uh, think about going ahead especially if this patient had any angina or whatever, or you thought he was at risk for heart failure, you had swelling in his ankles, et cetera, is to add a gliflozin, like an SGLT2 drug. And I'll give you the, which one, there, there's no head-to-head -head for any of these, so it's a little bit art of medicine, which one to pick. But the ADA is going to help you pick, as you're going to see on a slide or so. Uh, they continue the chlorothaladone for his blood pressure. You got to monitor with chem profile and year, a month, yearly uh, albumin and creatinine. And, of course, he's likely to be a candidate for uh, ACE or ARB in the future. And even if he doesn't get an albuminuria and he gets his blood pressure is harder to control, I'd just go ahead and add an ACE or an ARB anyway because he's going in that direction. So that's, that's fine to even do that sooner rather than later if he has blood pressure control issues. I already mentioned uptake trading is a torvastatin dose and then the weight control and management. So, and then this is the last slide. This is a one slide fits all for the American diabetes criteria. And most of these I've said, uh, the blood pressure, the lipids. I know I didn't say anything about platelets. And this has been in the news, even with uh, the AHA guidelines. What about my patient? Should he, should he be taking aspirin? And I begged off on this in this case. If he had CVD, almost everybody agrees to continue aspirin. Avoid aspirin if he has increased bleeding dose, but for primary prevention, uh, maybe, but not an awful lot of data. So uh, think about it. Ask, one of the things for sure is that get more used to asking your patients if you've ever had problems with taking aspirin and bleeding because the, the risk is, uh, is about 2% 2 2 per year. So, and it may be especially that we're no longer seeing favorable aspirin effects and I was part of the ASPRI trial. We didn't see it there in the elderly either. And, and it's because we're, we have so many patients on statins. And some of what statins are doing previously was done by aspirin. The glucose I've already mentioned, the revascularization, just to remember, CAB is generally preferred over PTCA, but our interventional colleagues keep picking away at this with newer stent designs and lifestyle and weight management. So thanks very much. Some of the drugs, particularly that have bringing a lot of glucose, that you stay, better watch your volume problems with some of them if you get dehydrated. Is that a big yeah. problem? Yeah, I, I think that's probably so. The questions about volume depletion with, um, I would think, especially the SGLT2s, 
with somebody also using Lasix. And because you may have a patient who's already borderline heart failure, and you're going to add an SGLT2 drug, and let's say he's already on Lasix 80 a day, and then you add this and he's going to diurese even more, you might back off for a few days on his Lasix as you add the other. You can always easily add back the Lasix. The, the, other, th the other point about this uh, is have them weigh themselves. You know, that's a simple thing for if they're at home and they have heart failure. I have one patient who I battle with some of my colleagues whether he can handle an SGLT2 drug. And he says, Dr. Wilson, I stopped it for a week and I gained weight. Nothing else changed. So he was frustrated. He says, I, I really would like to stay on it if I could. So, yeah. No questions. We have a question from Midtown. How significantly different are the impacts on MACE and the Impareg trial um, with uh, and pagliflozin, and these SGLT2 drugs compared with other medications like metformin, which seem like they would also intuitively improve ASCVD outcomes just by um, improving gl right. glycemic control. Yeah. So the questions uh, related to trials like the EMPA reg trials, those are taking usual diabetes care, and then you add a placebo versus adding the new molecule. And so that would be empagliflozin. And their key outcome uh, was originally a safety trial, but they had it made the trial so big, they said, we don't really want a safety trial. We want a superiority trial, and we think we're going to save lives. They had early signal that it would save lives. And it did save lives. So you already have metformin on board for the most part in that trial. It's metformin pl plus the new drug versus, and some of these patients, of course, were also on drugs in addition to metformin. So, and they try to make the trials being relatively potent in terms of the glucose control. It all comes down to what are the outcomes. And they balance out those trials. They're monitored by data safety monitoring boards. So the rest of the trial design, so it's beyond metformin. You're not going to get there just with, uh, with metformin. You've already also maximized the metformin in these patients. They're virtually on the 2,000 milligrams for almost all these trials uh, that they, they got enrolled in. Uh, the big issue for, I want to say, for, uh, uh, for the gliflozin types of drugs is the heart failure. And we now, with the most recent trial, uh, we do have uh, a signal, but the first one, the empagliflozin trial, we had a hint that the heart failure was going to be there. They did not apply for heart failure, and now we're getting follow-up studies, and you can guess what all of the cardiologists are doing. Does this work in half ref half pef et cetera, et cetera? Does it work in all the different subgroups? And there are a handful of studies uh, following up these that are, have been accepted but not published yet. Any other questions from the audience? Peter, we thank you. That was very informative, and Great. we appreciate you taking the time. Thanks. All right, thanks. <laughs>